Welcome back to another episode of the TBE podcast with your host Oli Forsyth, founder of TBE, the global community of 35,000 budding entrepreneurs. Today's guest is the founder of Yo Sushi, Simon Woodroff. But just before we dive into today's episode, if you are looking to start, grow or fundraise for your business, we would love to hear from you. Please visit www.tbeclub.com and get in touch. Now let's begin the interview. So I'm joined this morning by Simon Woodroff, the founder of Yo Sushi. Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm, it's always a dangerous subject, that one, because you can answer it with fine, which doesn't give you anything. Yeah. But I'm doing pretty good at this stage of my life, yeah. Good. And thank you for inviting me on your lovely houseboat. Mm. Yeah, this is a pretty cool place to live in London. It's very yeah. cool. Very cool. Would you have a breakfast this morning? I have the same as I have every morning, which is sort of my girlfriend is from Tahiti and she does a mixture of kind of Greek yogurt, not for that particularly Tahitian, <laughs> and sort of nuts and healthy things Very and nice. fruit and often exotic fruit. And I've taken to having a smaller bowl of everything now. A great way to kind of keep your really? weight good okay. is just to have smaller bowls. Interesting. And what is your favorite current company apart from your own? Um, God, that's the worst question you can possibly ask to me. Um, because, I, you know, I'm an, I'm, admirer, I'm an admirer of anybody who gets up and does every, anything. And I guess I used to know all the kind of new entrepreneurial companies, everything was happening in London and the towns around the world. And now I have a kind of broader view of the whole wide world. So, and I used to, you know, a lot of, I introduced a lot of entrepreneurs to each other in the day and all of that. And now I just get on with my own thing. Fair enough. And what is the one thing you would have changed um, before you were 20? The one thing I would have changed before yeah. I was 20? One thing you would have done differently? Before I was 20. Well, I had a pretty tumultuous teen and early 20s. You know, I was a fully paid up, fully fledged, peace sign giving love and peace hippie with a penchant for making a few bob on the side um and so i wouldn't have changed anything about that period it sounds pretty good um okay so tell us about your backstory before you started you you started in the events industry how did you get into that i i left school when i was 16 with two o levels and my dad always said you know do something that you enjoy because you're you know you're awake an awful lot of the time. And I really didn't enjoy anything to do with work, so I went into the rock and roll business as a roadie, putting the lights up in the early days of rock shows. And um, eventually I got a break when Rod Stewart actually wanted to do a big stage set, and nobody knew how to do stage sets. And I'd worked in the theatre, and I knew where you could get curtains and rostrums built and all of that. And a few weeks later... Somebody said to me at the dinner party, what do you do? And I said, I'm a stage designer. And that was what I did for many years. Through to Live Aid, um, when that whole rock business grew up, and I remember thinking to myself, something that your listeners would never have had the thought I'm sure of, which was, um, I've got to get out of this business before I get found out. You know, looking back now, I'm very proud of what I did. Yeah. But I got lost, and then I was in the television business. Um, selling television rights, non-creative business, but I learned international business, and then I made some extreme sports films. So I was going to go into the extreme sports world in the very beginning of that, and hopefully I would have been, that was what I would have been if I hadn't done yoga, but I came across Conveyor Belt Sushi, and that's what happened. And you left school, like you said, with two A-levels? Two, two O-levels, O-levels yeah. Back then. GCSEs, uh, in GCSEs. Yes. Um, Very dyslexic as well. No, I was not dyslexic. There was a, a TV program called The Mind of a Millionaire, three-part series in the, I suppose it was in the early 90s, which looked and analyzed people. And virtually all the entrepreneurs, or many of them, were dyslexic, as you're suggesting. And I'm not dyslexic, and so I'm the exception. Very interesting. Um, and you started this year back in 1997. How did you launch it and where did the idea come from? Well I started yeah really I started working on 1995 I'd been divorced I'd been thrown to my knees um, I knew I wasn't really employable um, and I was lost down to my last 200,000 pounds tied post-divorce tied up in my flat 
And I determined that I was going to start a new business and I was going to do all sorts of things. You know, extreme sports um, was one of them. Um, and I was going to start indoor climbing walls. And I was about to press the button on indoor climbing walls when I, my father had also always said, you know, go and ask people's advice. It's amazing who will listen to you if you can really learn to listen. And I'd asked a Japanese guy, I knew a guy called the name of Mr. Uehara, who was a Japanese television producer. And we were having lunch. He would taken me to a sushi lunch. And I said, what about sushi? Because I'd lived in LA and knew it. And he said, what you should do is a conveyor belt sushi bar with girls in black PVC mini skirts. And ping, the lights went on in my head. And I did the research. And that's how I started. That was in 1995, two years before I opened the first year of sushi. And where did you launch the first one? First year sushi I launched on January 22nd, 1997 um, in Poland Street, Soho, which in those days was the back street, which we pulled out. But you had a big queue going out the door. I had um, the first, uh, we had a big uh, um, uh, opening party. And during the period it was being built, I hadn't got any money for marketing really and I put up on the um, on the front of these three big windows we had on that street um, a coloured paper cover on which it had random words like Kirin conveyor robot round you know things like that and people walked by and they, they, people were going what's in there what's happening and we wouldn't let anybody look in and then really? the day, a couple of days when we were doing previews before we opened officially, we took the thing down and people were just walking past in Soho looking in through the window. And there was that moment of you've got to see what, what is going on really? there. Mm-hmm. And the first two weeks, nobody came. It was virtually empty. And the third Saturday, second Saturday actually, I think it was, we had a queue down the block and that queue lasted for five years. And it was incredible. Wow. It was like taking off very tight boots. It, we had an instant success, like having a hit record. And how difficult was it to grow the business? Well, that's when the problem started. You know, yeah. The day we opened. But I'd say it spent two years. I was going to open that restaurant at the end of one year. And if I'd opened it one year, I'd have opened a Japanese, typical Japanese conveyor belt sushi bar, you know, like there were, there were two and a half grand, thousand of them in, in Japan. They've been going since the 1960s. And I wouldn't be here today talking to you. Oh, yeah. And in that second year, all the things happened that made Yo Sushi a, a big hit when we first opened. There were a lot of things. It was very similar. It's not dissimilar to what it is today, actually. The big difference was that we had robots serving the drinks. And I remember the company who I had built the robots, a company called Brilliant Stages, who do things for me today, actually. Um, you, you, they do a lot of the big showbiz, you know, rock and roll shows, travel around the world, used to very fast track development of difficult things. And about a month before we opened that first restaurant in Poland Street, in Soho, on a building site, they turned up with the prototype of this robotic drinks trolley that I'd ordered. And we watched this thing drive very smoothly around the corner in the restaurant and speak, because part of my specification was each of them would speak in character. And as this one drove around the corner, it said, move your fat ass. Really? It's some, somebody's got a job to do in this restaurant. And people, I remember sort of watching it drive around and watching these people watching it, our customers. And this American turned to his wife. He said, Joan, Joan, did you hear what it said to me? It swore really? at me. <laughs> and... Uh, you know, oh, it's a robot. You know, and I realized that, you know, if you change the rules, change the playing field, um, you can do anything in this world. Interesting. And you grew to a certain size when you decided to take on a new CEO, Robert Rowland. Yeah, Robin came in as my operations director three years in with lots of problems with, we used to say chefs are from Venus and people are from mm-hmm. Mars. We had all sorts of things. We'd built the second restaurant. We'd built um, Harvey Nichols. You know, that was up and running. We'd built Selfridges. We built Finchley Road. We had, you know, the money was rolling rolling in, really. Mm-hmm. And but lots of problems. And Robin came on as ops director and was with me for a couple of years. And then said to me, you know, Simon, you're an absolute inspiration. None of this would have happened without you, but you change your mind all the time. You spend your money on projects. You know, I was always coming up with something new to do, and it's just not the way to run a business. And I said, well, if you think you can do better, you go ahead and run it. And they never believed them, me, none of them. But he really took it on. 
and built the business to where it is today. Wow. So he's left quite recently, actually. He's still a non-exec, but he's really the guy who did all the factory work. And we used to go, I remember going to um, an award show when I was getting an award for, you know, best this or that <laughs> or the other. And he said, you know, you know, mind you, I had 5% of the shares, but he had 5% or something. But um, uh, he said, why, you know, why do they always get you up on the stage? And I said, the thing is, Robin, that if you went up on the stage, you'd talk about the like for like figures from this year to last year, and I'll talk about the world and life and everything, and that's the difference. I actually met Robin two weeks ago. Yeah. Um, and obviously he was sharing the story. And tell us about the private equity meeting you had when you got the money in the bank and you went to Oxford Street. Yeah, well, Street. Robin really led the cavalry charge to really? sell the company, but I think about year six. And we dropped, so we were with 3i for a while, and then we dropped them, and we went with a smaller company called Primary. And I never really believed that we were going to make that deal. But, you know, fortunately, Robin did know that we were going to make that deal, and uh, well, he believed it. And so when we got to the lawyers' meeting, where I was just signing sort of 39 different documents, and, you know... Um, earning a substantial amount of money and um, you know they said well where do you want where do you want to put the money and you know, suddenly the lawyers who'd been awful people turned into really nice people and we had some champagne and all of that sort of stuff and they said where do you want the money and in those days we had checkbooks I pulled my checkbook out and gave them the sort code my current account number and they said the money will be in your account within 20 minutes from that last signature so I signed pretty quickly and I remember walking back a bit tipsy down Oxford Street where I lived in those days and seeing the ATM machine and thinking to myself, well, I'll have a look and just make sure it's there. And, you know, I stood in the queue and, um, and pressed, put my PIN number in. And there on the screen was a number which was kind of just an enormous sense of relief that, you know, I'd this pack of cards that I'd built that could have been blown over by blowing on it, um, you know, had survived and I'd got some money out of it. And um, so much so, and I stood there looking at it for so long, but the guy behind me was sort of coughing and spluttering, and I turned to him and I said, excuse me, mate, I said, I said, copper, look at this, you know, and I can tell you. Um, Did he say anything afterwards? Yeah, I don't know, but um, I can't remember, but uh, I'll tell you, if any of your listeners ever fall for that old ploy that money doesn't make you happy, they're like, the people are lying, I'll tell you that one. Yeah. You know, I don't think it makes you happy, actually. I think that is true. But I think that the sense of relief and to not have the um, the pressure and the stress of yeah. to having to meet financial commitments all the time gives you an enormous amount of freedom to go out and find your mojo, and yeah. perhaps that will make you happy. And go on a holiday, actually. And go on a holiday. Did you go on a well. holiday afterwards? I didn't really know. I carried on working for the next 10 years. But now I do go on holiday, and I Good. love it, and I do lots of things, yeah. Very nice. And what do you think the entrepreneurial mindset was like back then? And do you think it has changed massively where we are today? Um, yeah, I mean, Rich Branson always says that he could never have done what he did in his time, um, now because he hasn't got that sort of mind and and I think that I'm pretty much aligned with that you know I mean I can do an Excel spreadsheet and I can you know I can I actually could run Sage at the day you know yeah. the, the accounting firm I can draw on CAD you know I can do all those things and I think being able to do everything yourself is really important in, when you're starting something um, but I think it's a much higher bar now. It's certainly in terms of regulation and all of those things. And the kids coming up are much more, you know, for, for them it's normal. So I, I wouldn't be one of those people. I don't have such a disciplined mind, much more harder to do it now. Um, I think it's much easier to raise money now to get things off the ground. In my day, there was, there was no uh, startup. We used to call it the three Fs, friends, family, and fools. You know, and there's a yeah. bit, of a, bit of that involved. Um, but it's fantastic where, where it's come to. But I was very, very lucky because I rode the crest. I was one of the very early entrepreneurs um, with a profile of some sort in this country um, when it was just taking off, when mm -hmm. the entrepreneur thing yeah. suddenly, you know, people, kids were growing up in the playground thinking, what am I going to do? You know, I'm going to be the fourth entrepreneur was such a bad word. You know, it's almost like a sort of spiv or, you know, somebody who's trying to screw you. And then suddenly the kids were going, what are you going to be? Is it, you know, a, a, film star or pop star or an entrepreneur it was very cool and I was very lucky to be around that very interesting very exciting and you were obviously on the first series of Dragon's Den first series of Dragon's Den I did I, I very nearly didn't do it actually because um, I turned it down because I didn't have a great deal of money in those days 
and um, I thought, oh, God, it's too big a risk. And um, so, uh, uh, and then everybody started talking about this program that was in our entrepreneurial really? world that was going to come out. And I thought, oh, drat, you know, I've made a major mistake here because they asked me to be on it at the beginning. And they did a pilot and they called me up and said, look, there's one person on the pilot show we are not happy with. Would you just consider again whether you'd come on and do it? And I said, oh, where do I sign? So I went on and that's how I got into Dragon's Den. And it was a pretty amazing experience really to do Dragon's Den was we did Dragon's Den before Dragon's Den was known by anybody of course yeah. nobody had ever seen it yeah. we made it you know blind and actually the way it's filmed today is exactly the same way that they film it um, they filmed in our first series you know which really? is it's filmed as live the money next to you is bits of words of paper but it really yeah. is our money yeah. uh, is the questions people always ask and I remember it came out and it was almost instantly everybody knew about it it was very very exciting time I remember phoning everybody up and saying what do you think and Peter what's it was a bit vain and Rachel Alner was too busy keeping her red letter days afloat which later very publicly went bust and yeah. everybody had a view and I remember phoning up Duncan Bannerton and saying oh, what do you think Duncan he said uh, oh he said uh, he said, they recognize me on the street. He said, I fucking love it. Really? <laughs> <laughs> do they recognize you? Well, yeah, of course, people do recognize you. And I'm a friendly sort of guy. So yeah. um, I, I really liked, I enjoyed all of that, you know, so I'll do at some level. But, you know, the thing people always I say, well, give me some advice. I'm going on Dragon's Den, see if I can get the best. And I said, well, I said, well the first thing you've got to remember is this is not a business show. This is show business. You know, at some level of yeah. course it's a business yeah. show but it's show business and there's five dragons up there thinking not thinking am I going to get any good investments out of this they're thinking um, um, how, how is my performance going to be how am I going to look on television um, as, as I'm sure a lot of the people who are walking up the stairs are thing. and underneath that is probably more of a thing from the dragon's point of view hey, uh, how can I make some investments so I participate in this but without exactly. losing too much money and I, my claim is that in the first three series of Dragon's Den I made more money than any other dragon and then people yeah. say well how much did you make and I say zero that was more than anybody yeah. else yeah. and I'm sure people do make a bit more money now but not then and do you still keep in touch with the dragons? Or? And Duncan I'm um, in touch with. Um, Doug I'm in touch with. Um, Peter I've seen occasionally. Um, I think Duncan is the one that's a friend really more than anything. He's retired in Portugal now. He's, he's, he's moved to Florida, I believe. Oh, I haven't seen him in a little bit. But so I, would, I would consider him a friend. Very nice. And then moving on to Yotel. Uh -huh. How did that idea come about? Um, well, you know... Um, I'd always aspired, you know, if you look at people who've taken a brand name, um, we had a designer who said, yeah, it was always destined to be a brand and just happened to be a sushi bar in its first manifestation. And that was quite a, a strong statement for me. And if you look at people who, who do multi-brands, there's very few people who've done it. I mean, Virgin obviously is the big one. You, you could say easy in this country, is it? But then the, who's in third place? There's nobody who really stands out. So I was aspired to be in that third place, and we're still working on doing that. Um, so I thought, well, if we've done hotels, what do you do next? If you've done restaurants, what do you do next? Hotels are pretty obvious. And I started, and I'm at my happiest. I think one of the great secrets of life is to figure out what you're good at. Yeah. And then try and spend 90% of your time, not, not 100, but 90% of your time doing what you're good at. And I am good um, at an empty table like we're sitting at here. And in fact, here in the houseboat here is this is a table that a lot of ideas have been dreamt up really? at, just right here, um, with a sheet of paper and, and sketch. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, with a sheet of paper, sketching, drawing, with no yeah. rule, whatever. I like to do real things. I'm not at land particularly. Um, and uh, so I'm good at uh, creating things, getting people enthusiastic, getting things started up. I'm good at publicizing them and marketing them and all that side of it. Um, and I like to work with people who are good at the detail of running it all through. Oh, well, I'm pretty good at detail as well, but I can be like, over-interfering and controlling, and I'm not always right. But that's one of the great lessons I've learned. Um, so where are we going with this question? Um, how did so how did the idea come about? Oh, yeah. uh, so um, so that's that's what we thought. I thought well, it was obvious to a hotel, and we started looking at. I, I think I have a hundred different drawings somewhere of anything. Could have been anything. Could have been kind of egg shaped pods in airports, mm -hmm. and we eventually came up, which was what we came up with, and we. Um, um, I met a guy called Gerard Green, who became who came on with me. He brought another investor in as well. And we developed a prototype, always been a big 
believer in developing real prototypes just by, rather than just by doing things with drawings. And we exhibited it at 100% design. And people walked in and said, this is the future. You know, it was, a, it was yeah. a super luxury in a very, very small space. That was the idea of it. And um, the idea was the windows looked out on the corridors so we could go into spaces that nobody else could go into. And we could sell rooms by the hour, certainly in airports, which is where we started out. Um, we could sell rooms by the hour rather than by the, by the day. And so I remember standing in conferences and, you know, so Kurt Ritter from Radisson Hotels stood up on the conference platform and said, you know, we did 96% occupancy last year. And I said, well, we've never done any hotels, but actually our hotel in Gatwick did 250% occupancy that thing really? last year. Wow. So that was really something. And then from there, um, Gerard, who had become a fully-fledged partner by then, um, was... Um, was in New York and came across uh, um, uh, one of the big property companies over there and you know the long and short of it was that they gave us a hotel or we did a deal with them on a hotel site which is already semi-designed and converted to be a you know interpreted it to be a hotel and we opened 700 rooms in New York and that was the stepping stone really to what we've got now which is um, a lot of hotels being built around the world and I sell rather like I did with Yo Sushi I sold my shares two years ago in Yotel um, with a contract I, I, I get a percentage royalty in I saw that with Yo Sushi as well that's right with Yo Sushi that. as well exactly well it's just focusing on what I'm good at I'm yeah. good at starting things creating them getting them going marketing them and you need to give it to people who are really focused you have really good teams on rolling things out and uh, that's what Yotel has done extremely successfully under the guidance now. Gerard moved on to other things. He's got another business of his own now. But Hubert Verrio, who runs uh, Yotel, is, I mean, uh, it always amazes me, but they are building a lot of, ho we're building a lot of hotels around right, so the world. So you just now. raised quite a lot of money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we raised a quarter of a million yeah. uh, dollars last year. Last year. And uh, he's building a lot of hotels. Yeah. Because, you know, uh, the way it works in the that hotel business is that um, property owners around the world have properties they want to build hotels on. They consider we're going to go with W with Yotel or with Hilton. And right now we're flavor of the month. We're delivering people. We can get double the number of uh, rooms onto the same size sites as anybody else. We're still providing four-star luxury. Um, it's a no-brainer, really, and we're operating them very, very well. And they've been, for the most part, pretty successful. You always have a few difficult bits, but they've, they've done really, really well. And the public have taken to them and had so property developers, so uh, long may it last. But, you know, we have a thing both in Yo Sushi and in Yotel that I started years ago called Can I, C-A-N, new word, I, question mark. And it stands for constant and never-ending innovation or improvement. And that's, you know, that's what the 21st century businesses need to do. You, you know, to, to succeed in this world, you know, the, the, the bar is very high. You know, whatever you do has got to be great, 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 great. And um, you've got to constantly reinvent it to stay in that place. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, uh, and, and so is right. So is right. But um, that, that is the, you can't just say we'll roll out now on a cookie cutter basis. You're constantly reinventing. Exciting. And your latest venture, Yo Home. And Yo Home, well, Yo Home has been, uh, it's taken me six years to date, and I'm hopefully it's 2019 next year we'll be up and running with the first one. You know, in the UK? Or? In the UK, yeah, we have a site in Manchester which we're going to build out. But the, the, it's different. It's a radical hotel, uh, sorry, radical home system for both rental and sale and service departments indeed. Uh, it's called Yo Home. Um, and they are single room apartments which have mechanical moving parts that transform one. So every room is, with, well, for example, one of our rooms is 500 square feet um, and it changes from a 500 square foot bedroom to a 500 square foot sitting room to a 500 square foot dining and kitchen room. You know, so the thing is, you're, 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 yeah. you're lifting your eyes to my house but here. I suppose it's, it's, it's got making, some yeah. of those, the, those bits to it, yeah. But no, these are, these are real transforming. But so there's that part, which is a radical interior. And then we've got a very clever building system which we think will dramatically reduce costs of building around the world as well and can be shipped in containers around the world. So it's a very low cost building system, a radical interior, plus the Yo brand. So we think those three things is, you know, is can radically change housing and can also be adapted to high end housing and even to low cost housing. So, you know. And can people only buy them or you can, can buy them, you can rent them. 
you know, it'll be all sorts. Um, Do you think co-living but, is? So again, co-living I think is co-living's a big thing. I think yeah. um, we'll. I'm sure that Yo will go into Yo work as well. You know, yeah. like we work or whatever. You know, that it's a it's a whole reinvention, and you we know, it's taken about. me a long time to do it. And I, you know, and actually, I'm remiss. I should. I'm not going to do anything that takes that long again. Um, especially as I'm getting older but um, you know the thing is that to really do things differently you've got to prototype we're just on our third prototype now and you've got to um, you know you've got to arrive at market with a product that is really refined and um, and really and really radical but you've got to arrive at market and um, you've got to get the first one up because once you've got the first one up then you start running you know interesting and do you think your Target markets are people just leaving university, 20, 25 year olds. I think the target market for Yo Home. I've always said that we don't have target markets when we're yeah. events. Because, you know, if you want to make God laugh, show him your business plan. Or as exactly. John Lennon said, you know, life is what happens when you're busy making other plans, or business is the same. So I think that Yo Homes will be for all sorts of people. Um, very very wide but you know the thing is to do is to get the first ones up and running and then see what the target, target market appears we'll certainly sell them all pretty quickly I'd imagine and I would like to be able to um, undercut everybody you know I mean yeah. every property developer in the world is trying to get the highest bucks he possibly can for his apartments I want to build lots and lots and lots of apartments around the world and for people to go wow and you know, exactly. even if we force yeah. the price of apartments down and then we're the only one left standing yeah. because the only ones who can and apart from properties, anything else you like to do? I saw you were going to go into the funeral business. Uh, somebody <laughs> said, what would the funeral business be called? And so we had a bar once called Yo Below. They said that'd be a great name for a funeral business. And in fact, I, I'm, that's what I'm going to have on my... Uh, Spike Milligan, of course, famously had... Uh, I, I told you I was ill on his gravestone when he died. He was a comedian really? in the 60s. And he said, I told you I was ill. I think on my gravestone, and I think of having it done, actually, having the gravestone made in advance so I can see it, I think I'm just going to write Yo Below. <laughs> have it done. Um, what am I going to do next? I've actually, um, um, you know, I think it's starting to seep out, but I've, um, um, I've bought an island in the Bahamas, 100-acre island. Do you have already? I have already. Wow. I'm an owner of a 100-acre island. There's nothing on it whatsoever. And we have a name which is Yotopia. Wow. And um, the rest is to be yes, seen. To be Very seen, that's enough. That was for the next episode. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And would have been some of the lowest moments in your personal career? Just, was it starting out? Where did you go when it got really difficult? Um, I've had three major incidents, including the one when I left school and I thought, where am I going? Three major incidents where I have been completely lost. <laughs> And I would say depressed as well. I don't suffer from depression, but if there's enough pressure comes on, yeah. you know, I can get pretty down. And I know what it's like when you're in that hole having to climb out. And there'll be some people listening today who, who've been to that place. It's very, very hard. Um, but I climbed out every time. Um, I think that the, um, for me, um, what has always got me going is ideas. You know, that's what turns me on, is ideas of how you can radically do something different and the possibility. I've, like many entrepreneurs, I've never got out of bed to make absolutely tons of money. Um, having tons of money is absolutely great. Love it. But I've never been the real drive for me. The idea has always been the real drive and the doing it with the people. Um, can't remember what I was saying. But, I just, you know, but that, that's, that's really been, been the thing for me, the drive. Yeah. What was the question? Um, where do you go when it gets very difficult? Oh, yeah. Where, yeah. where do I go when it gets difficult? So um, I think that enthusiasm has got what's got me out of the hole when I get an idea that turns me on and that's the enthusiasm that gets me out and I want to develop it and I can't wait to get up in the morning to get sketching or calling people up or putting it together and making it happen. And I'd be very lucky that I've got a financial brain as well as a... When I say a financial brain, I'm not a financial <laughs> genius, but I'm sensible about money. You know, people say you take enormous risks and I'm sure I have, but I also want to be absolutely careful about course, every yeah. single thing. So I've got a mixture of financial nous and um, people skills and creative brain as well. And that, that's you know, it's a pretty powerful combination. People always say to me, oh, I'm no good at such and such. Um, um, I need a partner to do that. 
And I, in a way, I always think, you know, that, you know, I'm sure people have done that. There are some good partnerships, but at the very outset of something, if you can have just one brain at it, or possibly two, you're much better. And if you, 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 we all are capable of doing everything, even the things that we don't think we're capable of doing. Yeah. You know, I can do accounting. You know, um, and I think it's much better in the early days of a business. I think a, a benevolent dictatorship is a really way to megalomania is a very good way to start but when you're I don't know two three four years in whatever you're it's called for in that particular business um, it's much better to hand over and let other people do things so you know the two things is yeah. different yeah and we'll give you the idea of buying a houseboat a houseboat you can get all the money in the world <laughs> you can buy a houseboat <laughs> and you've got one next door and you've got one down yeah. the road yeah yeah, no, it's nice, and uh, I I was looking for a you know um, interesting place to live in London. I wanted to live on the river. I looked at all the penthouse flats along the river here. None of it turned me on. It was a bit like living in a prison. And I came across these houseboats, and in fact, I came across a, I mentored somebody who ran an estate agency dealing in houseboats and river properties. And I said, if you could, a good houseboat comes up, and they called me one day and said, this is a really old one. Come up, but it's got good lease, and it's, you know it's really worth doing. They said, you know, I said, okay, I'll buy it. And they said, well, when do you like to look at it? And I said, well, put the offer in now. And if they accept it, I'll come and look at it afterwards. And they did. They offered the asking price. And I bought it for a quarter million quid. And, um, and it's all, and none of those exist anymore, those houseboats I bought. We rebuilt from scratch brand new houseboats. Really? So you're sitting wow. on a, you're not sitting on a sort of manky, smelly, cold houseboat. You're sitting in a lovely loft here on the river in Chelsea. And it's a really nice place to live. And I've always loved the river. I, I've always loved the water. I'm a sailor. I'm a sailor, a climber. Um, I sailed across the Pacific in my catamaran. Oh, wow. So yeah. I've always loved the water. And my girlfriend's in Tahiti. She says she loves it because in Tahiti, wherever you go, you see the water. So exactly. she can see the water here. So it's, it's, it's really a nice place to live. And do you find it here helps you relax? You can make of new ideas? Instead of living yeah, there. I think, you know, we're very lucky here because, you know, I live on this corner of the river in Chelsea, which uh, Turner and both Turner and Whistler, the painters, always said this is the best corner of the Thames. It has a view right down to Putney and right up yeah. um, past the pagoda in Battersea Park and all of that. And uh, it has a very large vista, and there's very few places that have a large vista. If you live in one of those super expensive houses on Regent's Park, you get a vista mm -hmm. over Regent's Park yeah. or Hyde Park. Is that one? And this has got a long vista, so um, and it's quiet here. Amazingly, it's quiet. And I think it's quiet here on the river because um, they said it in towns, it's noisy because the sound bounces off buildings. Here, there's nothing to bounce yeah. off here, nothing, and it's yeah. pretty quiet here. And where do you want to go in the next five years? Do you want to build new companies? Um, no, more of going? the same, really. Look, uh, getting your home off the ground. If I get your home off the ground, and then um, Utopia, my island, I think that'll be me done. Um, and Would you like I'll, to retire on your island? Well, I wouldn't say I'll ever retire. That's not a word that's really relevant anymore, I don't think, for me anyway. Kind of carry on doing things. Um, but certainly spend some time there and a great sailing area. Um, but, you know, I can work from wherever I am. But I would like to be able to say, look, you've eaten in your sushi. You've slept yeah. in your hotel. Yeah. You live in your home. Now come and visit us on Yotopia. Very nice. Very nice. And finally, what would you, uh, sorry, what advice would you give to a budding entrepreneur? Well, you know, I think it's as risky to get on the slippery ladder of corporations or work for somebody as it is as a young man to get into something of your own with your friends. And I think you'll see more and more people doing things on their own, even just providing the services that they would have supplied to a company that supplied from themselves. And I think your generation is a generation that's going to do that more and more. And I think Britain is no longer a nation of shopkeepers. Well, I don't think we ever have been, really. We've been a nation of entrepreneurs, you know, since we did, went out and did abominable exactly. things to yeah. the natives around the world. You know, we've gone and done stuff. And so I think, you know, and I often think that, you know, if somebody landed from outer space and they said, um, they said, hey, where, where's it all been happening on the planet the last thousand years? And they said, well, go and check out this little island in the top right-hand corner of the North Atlantic. You know, people go, well, what? On that little island? All this stuff happened yeah. all these years? Um, I also think that Britain's a very interesting place. One of the things I've learned through traveling is that people really like us. 
they really like the Brits. I mean, they really, really do. We, we, we don't know that, most of us. Uh, we're very popular. We're popular for our culture, for our manners, for our sense of humor. Um, people really like us. And um, so being a British entrepreneur is about as good as it gets. And I never uh, met the person who went out to do what they dreamed of doing, regardless of whether they later succeeded or failed, because you can always get up and start up again, especially when you're younger. I never met the person who went out to do what they dreamed of doing and regretted it, regardless of whether they succeeded or failed. But I met many, many people who from later in life look back and said, I wish I'd taken more opportunities, taken more risks when I had the chance. Amazing. Well, Simon, thank you so much for your time and uh, good luck with it all. Thank you. Thank you. So another inspirational guest on this week's TPE podcast. If you are looking to start, grow or fundraise for your business, please don't forget to get in touch with us. You can do this by visiting www.tpeclub.com. We have so many more exciting and inspirational entrepreneurs still to come on the show. So to avoid missing out on any future episodes, please don't forget to hit the subscribe button and please give us a review. Thank you so much and good luck.